we're really in some difficult material here in Acts. You can read Acts yourself and then take it at, at, at its face value. So, um, and if you think it's a fair presentation, that's fair enough. Uh, I'm not against that. Uh, so um, I don't see that one person who doesn't uh, go along with Acts in its overt form and feels there's more uh, lurking, as I said, on, underneath the surface than it originally meets the eye. And a person who, in fact, can show you the sources to some extent and the material that is lurking underneath the surface of Acts. Um, and that's what a university is for. So um, what I want to find is digging underneath the surface to look at Christian origins. That's what we're trying to do. And in particular, look at the Paul-James relationship as a factor influencing the presentation of the Book of Acts. I think we are proving that the Paul-James um, polemic argument uh, has a lot of bearing on the way Acts is presenting things. So, for instance, we showed you that when they go up on the steps in the temple, which is the picture we have in this pseudo Clementine uh, recognition, that um, James is missing from the picture. It's Peter and John, and we would normally be led to expect that it would be Peter, John, and James. And the fact that he isn't there makes one wonder why he isn't there. Now, the material that we're getting into here is very difficult material. Paul has been introduced to us, and he has decimated the early ch church, according to this, uh, this picture here. And in the meantime, the narrative is switching back and forth uh, between Paul, Peter, a person called Philip, who we were not introduced to in the Gospels. But he suddenly appears without any discussion of uh, what he's involved in. And he's up in Samaria for some reason, having confrontations with another character who was given short shrift, Simon Magus, who we never hear from again in the book of Acts, and yet who seems to have been an extremely important person in early Christian history, as far as all the literature that we know about him. So Acts is uh, certainly making its editorial choices. So we have here in chapter 8, 12, Philip believed, or they believed Philip, and he was preaching these things. Once again, 14, Peter and John joined them in Samaria. Again, where is James? Even James, the brother of John. Now, in my work, I don't think there is a James, the brother of John. I think that that is an overwrite part of the, I hate to say, shell game that the book of Acts is playing in order to downplay and write the other James out of the narrative. In other words, his place is taken, is taken by James, but he's not the brother of Jesus that Acts is a very uh, concerned not to reveal to us and never does call James the brother of Jesus, does he? Now, there's got to be a reason for that. And uh, Simon answered them, and it makes a comment in 24, and then that's the end of it. And then in 25, and they preached the gospel in many villages and in, uh, of the Samaritans, and that's the end of it. That's the end of it. You mean Samaria became Christian? Not to my knowledge. As far as I know, the Samaritans still have their own religion, even in the modern time, and it's not Christianity. So again, I have no, no idea what went on in Samaria, and I don't think this book knows either. Josephus tells us Samaria became Christian, not to my knowledge. Next episode, 26. Philip. He's on his way, as we said last time, to Gaza. And he meets an Ethiopian eunuch, who is supposed to be the person over the treasury of a woman called Queen Kandakis from Ethiopia. And they're supposed to get to be Christians at this point. Now, there's no record that Ethiopians became Christians at this point in any place, in any document, anywhere. But, there is a conversion to a kind of Judaism that isn't really totally Judaism. And that conversion is Queen Helen. 
she was very interested in the temple and she gave the candelabra to the temple that the Romans took to Rome in their victory celebrations that's on the Arch of Titus today. She was a very important convert to so-called Judaism. But in Josephus, it's quite clear that the conversion has a problem on circumcision. We know that James is the party of the circumcision, so-called, whatever that means. And Paul is a, has a big issue over circumcision in uh, several of his letters, particularly the letter to the Galatians, where he fulminates against now something that most people don't realize was a Roman law called the Lex Cornelia, the Sicarius, a Beneficia. But this means the law of Cornelius, and we're going to meet Cornelius as the Roman centurion momentarily in Acts. And Sicarius we know about from the Sicarii, but in, in, in Latin this doesn't mean terrorist assassin, it means circumciser. And this is the law forbidding bodily mutilation with a knife, circumcision, and other kinds of bodily mutilations that the Romans considered all these things, castration, bodily mutilation, to be part of the same syndrome. And that's what I think the eunuch here is all about. That it's a joke on the fact that the issue of circumcision was important to Queen Helen's family. And this book knows that. The important thing that in Josephus, Josephus pictures the two descendants of Queen Helen. And they're reading the scripture when a Galilean teacher comes. And they're reading Genesis, and he says, do you understand the significance of what you are reading? And they immediately, and they immediately went out according to Josephus and circumstances. And, and so here we are. Here we are. Philip jumps up on the back of the chariot. He asks the Ethiopian eunuch. The eunuch relates to the circumcision of Helen's sons. And finally, he's not reading Genesis. He's reading the... Isaiah 53, 11, the suffering servant passage upon which all Christian theology of a calling kind has been based ever since. And what does he do? He doesn't jump off the chariot and circumcise himself. What does he do? He immediately jumps off and is baptized. But the rest falls into place very nicely because we know from Eusebius, as you read, and it's in Josephus too, that Helen sent her treasury agents to Palestine. Well, there was a famine in the land. We're going to hear about the famine momentarily in Acts, it's out of place, but who's going to proclaim the famine? A prophet called Agabus. I tell you, there never was a prophet called Agabus. What there was, was the conversion of King Agbara, Queen Helen's husband. So now, he's presented as converting to Christianity, but interestingly enough, in the story of the conversion of her family to Judaism and her sons, there's another teacher who accompanies Ananias. There's a second unnamed teacher who gets in among Queen Helen's uh, harem, and they say that circumcision is not required. So Ananias and the second teacher, whom I think of course is Paul, do not consider circumcision necessary. And finally, Paul and Barnabas are going to go up to Jerusalem at the beginning of the episode, to bring famine relief. Who's the person that sent famine relief to Jerusalem? Queen Helen. And it says, she sent her treasury people to buy grain in Egypt and Cyprus in order to supply Jerusalem with grain. Well, that's where this guy is going. He's on his way to Egypt, Gaza. Gaza is the gateway to Egypt. Anyway, Philip evaporates. After baptizing the eunuch, who also evaporates and is never heard from again. And Philip then suddenly appears in a different town and then he's preaching the gospel all the way to Caesarea. End episode. Another bit of blue. Back to Paul, chapter 9. Paul, still breathing threats and murders against the Lord's disciples, he wanted to get letters from the high priest to the synagogues in Damascus. Now we're going to get the Damascus thing. 
uh, has to do with the settlements of the land of Damascus and the Dead Sea Scrolls, the desert camps, as they're told. There were camps supposedly all in the Damascus land, and I think the land of Damascus goes all the way up to Edessa and northern Iraq. And what they're talking about is all the Arab areas where they had spread out these baptizing uh, communities of the kind of the Dead Sea Scrolls. That is presented as the synagogues at Damascus. I think Paul did go to these places. Paul in his uh, letters, as you know, in Galatians says, when he got his vision, and it's not going to be the same as here, so let's just quick look at what he says in Galatians so we can compare what he's going to say here with what um, Acts, with what Acts uh, has to say. And I said, where there's a conflict between Acts and Paul's own testimony, normally we would prefer Paul's own testimony. And he's talking about the fact that he doesn't lie. Uh, God chose to reveal his son in me, line 16 of chapter 1, that I might preach the gospel about him to the peoples, to the nations. And uh, in fact, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, in the Damascus document, they make fun of someone who has lying visions. Uh, um, they call people like him daubers on the wall. Variation of the King James, which is pretty good stuff, actually. Here it is. They have misled the people, led the people astray by crying peace when there is no peace. And because when the people of this kind build a wall, their prophets daub upon it whitewash. These are the daubers upon the wall of the Damascus document. And uh, uh, say to those who daub upon the wall with whitewash that that they, it shall fall, and where is the daubing then which you have daubed upon it with? And then it goes on like me. Now Paul says in his in the vision that he got, <coughs> so God chose to reveal his son in me, that I should preach the gospel about him to the nations, Galatians 6, 1, 16. Nor did I go up to Jerusalem, as we said last time, to the, those who were apostles before me, but I immediately went away to Arabia, and later I returned again to Damascus. And after three years I went up to Jerusalem to make friends with Peter and remained with him 15 days, at which time I met James, the brother of the Lord, but I did not meet anyone else and no one was not known by sight. All right? Everyone agree that's what he says here? Anyone disagree on that point? Okay, Acts doesn't have any trip to Arabia. Acts doesn't have him not coming to Jerusalem for three years. Acts has him going right up to Jerusalem not long after and meeting everyone. Let's see what Acts says, because this is the most famous episode in early Christianity, aside from the Gospels, I think. Paul's vision on the road to Damascus. So Paul gets his letters, and uh, anyone who were of the way, notice the way terminology here. The way is very strong in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So, that he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. That's obviously supposed to be a parallel to what we got in the Pseudo-Clementine. Because the person who led the riot that attacked James, where James was injured, and they took him down to Jericho, then gets letters from the high priest to pursue the community to Damascus. Anyway, as he drew near Damascus, and he doesn't mention this at all in, in Galatians, he says he didn't go to Damascus. He says he went to Arabia and then to Damascus. Uh, a light came, and a, I fell down, and this a voice came out and cried, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Probably one of the most famous episodes in early Christian history. And he said, I am Jesus, and so on. And, I, and, and Paul trembled and was astonished, and he was speechless. And they brought him to Damascus. And he didn't, uh, he was three days, line nine, without eating and drinking. Not eating and drinking is a very important thing about the people who take Nazarite oaths. Uh, they will not eat or drink until they have killed Paul later on in Acts uh, uh, 22 and 23. And uh, there were people who were taking these kind of oaths. But here, Paul is not eating and drinking. And then, who appears? Line 10. A certain disciple in Damascus named Ananias. Well, we've heard of him in Josephus, and we've heard of him in the Agabus. Do I think it's, and in the conversion of Queen Helen. Do I think it's all the same person? Yes. So Ananias gets a vision. He says, go to a street called the Straight, make a straight way in the wilderness, and go to the house of one Judas. Ah, I think this is Thaddeus, Judas Thomas, 
Judas the twin, the one who we know went up to Agrippas, uh, and or sent Thaddeus, and so on and so forth. The Judas Barsabbas in the book of Acts, who takes the letters to Antioch. Here he's called Judas, and then later he's identified as, I think, a tanner. But anyway, Paul goes to the house of this Judas. I think it's this brother of Jesus that we call uh, Judas, Jude, the brother of Jesus, in the letter of Jude. Jude, the third a brother of Jesus. Simon, James, Jude, and Joseph. In any case, he appears, he never appears again. So Paul is involved with two people, Ananias and Judas. Both people appear in the Agrippas correspondence in Eusebius. That is Ananias and Judas, but here it's Judas Thomas, if you recall. Remember? At the end of uh, book one in, uh, in Eusebius. Anyway, they lay hands on him, and um, he's baptized, and uh, he's amazed, 21, and, and uh, um, he used to want to destroy everyone. Paul then starts preaching in Damascus, and he, he grew in strength, line 22. He confounded the Jews who lived in Damascus. So the Jews were looking at all the gates, they're all powerful, they want to kill him, and then uh, he escapes by night, and the disciples let him down the wall, lowering in a basket, there's the key, link it up with two Corinthians, and you can decide for yourself. And now we're ready for Peter's tablecloth vision. As the Damascus document tells us that the New Testament, as we just read in the land of Damascus, was to, to separate holy from profane. Now we're going to hear what? You should not separate the holy from profane. And the chief representative of Christianity to be in the future, Peter, is now going to learn it. Uh, which this temple of vision goes on quite a while, chapter 9, 10, 11. And uh, Peter escapes from prison and leaves the country for good. So uh, we've got to have a new leader, and it's James, but we are not introduced to who he is. And then in chapter 13, we're going to get the, uh, the Agabus material about the famine and the famine relief and Paul going up to Jerusalem to uh, win the famine relief mission that we had. And then finally in chapter 15, we're going to get the Jerusalem Council about the issue of circumcision. And finally in 16, the we document is going to appear and we're going to be on solid ground. So the first 15 chapters of Acts, I have to do this with. <laughs> I really should... Uh, explain uh, why I have um, the approach I have and what provokes it in books like you see. In chapter um, 5 and 6 of book 2, when the uh, followers of James at least seem to leave Jerusalem before its destruction. Here those that believed in Christ, having removed from Jerusalem as if holy men had entirely abandoned the royal city itself and the whole land of Judea, the divine justice for their crimes against Christ and his Apostles finally overtook them, destroying the whole generation of these evildoers from off the earth. So, uh, this is where these charges that I've been talking about come from. But he goes on um, about how this woman eats her own children. Seizing her little son who was yet at her breast, she said, Wretched child, the midst of war, famine, and faction, for what do I preserve thee? Our condition among the Romans, though we, though we might live as slavery, but even slavery is anticipated by famine. Come, and be thou food to me. And this is my own son, she said, and the deed is mine. Eat, for I too have eaten, but not more delicate than a woman, nor more tender. So she eats her own son. Thenceforth the wretched people, overcome with hunger, only strove to hasten death. Uh, and it was happiness yet for those who died before they heard and saw miseries such as these. Such then was the vengeance that followed the guilt and impiety of the Jews against the Christ of God. This is the kind of approach that took over the Roman Empire in the 300s because the writer of that who writes those words and but does he is he feeling any pity for anybody? Not really. He enjoys it. He likes it. He likes the fact that they're undergoing this. They get the message from Acts here. This is the message of Acts, of the chapters we have been reading. Uh, it's repeated over and over again. So they get the message. So these um, uh, the, the writers also had that message here. And um, for some reason they felt they, in order to convert large numbers of people, they needed to imbue them with this uh, hatred that also. Okay, so... Um, 
We did the material about Philip and the uh, Ethiopian Queen's eunuchs baptism and Philip ending up, though he was on his way to Gaza, somehow ending up in Caesarea. Now, again, to emphasize uh, the oddness of that, I'll draw the map that we uh, here is Jerusalem. This we know now is Gaza down here. So Philip is on his way like this when he bumps into the Ethiopian somewhere. And this is the gateway to Egypt. So that's why I think they're on their way. The, the grain buying people, the treasury agents of Queens like Queen <coughs> Helen, are on their way to get grain from Egypt to bring back to relieve the famine in the early 40s. It's all in Josephus and in your Eusebius book. I think that's what's being parodied here in the book of Acts. So, uh, we have uh, Philip on his way here, but he meets an Ethiopian eunuch and somehow he ends up here in a disembodied way. I and mean, it's difficult to say how he ended up here. But anyway, we have then chapter 9 of Paul being introduced and how he gets his vision. And we showed how in Galatians this was, um, this was not really paralleled by what he said there. In fact, uh, he doesn't mention going to Damascus. He, he says he went away to Arabia. And since I have, in my books, have presented Arabia as stretching, I think the Romans saw all this as Arabia, more or less the way we do now. So when he says he went to Arabia, that's what he says in Galatians, right? That can mean he went over here, which is normally the beginning, Petra is over here, to Petra. Or it can mean he went all the way up here someplace. Since he went up there for two or three years, my feeling is he went up here. Because he suddenly appears up here someplace in Antioch. And now the question is, which Antioch? Is it this Antioch or this Antioch on the coastline here? And I express the opinion it's the Syriac Antioch, what's called Edessa. And today it's in Turkey, it's called Urfa. And that this was the king that certainly that we do have converted in, in Eusebius as the first uh, king converted. And then over this way is Adyabidi, the king of these areas east here. And over here was Persia, so that's off our map. So this is a kind of uh, buffer area in between Persia and the Romans, and they were fighting each other. In fact, there was a big battle that took place here where the Roman legions were defeated south of Edessa. That's why I emphasize all this geography, because I think it's very important uh, to the book of, it's very important to the book of Acts. In Syriac and related languages, bathing, ritual immersion that these groups like John the Baptist in particular, daily bathing groups. And in southern Iraq to this day, down here, and I've got this down, there are bathers still, and the Arabs call them, after the Syriac, Suba. The Suba of the marshes, are the Sabans of the marshes. The Sabans in Arabic from Syriac means bathers. Now when uh, Eusebius lists the different groups of Judeo-Christian <coughs> sects, <coughs> He includes under this another Syriac uh, group called the Masbutans. <coughs> you have to look at the roots of all these, and here's the root. Masbuta, again, Syriac for immersion. So, these are, that, it, according to different languages, these pop up in the Quran. The Muslims today still speak of three protected groups, Jews, Christians, and what's the third protected group that are not considered unbelievers, but are considered people of the bulk, Dhimis, to be protected by Islam, and that they shouldn't be uh, destroyed. All others, it's Islam or the sword, idolaters and others. But not Jews, Christians, and Sabans. Everyone knows who the Jews and Christians are, but who are the Sabans? Oh, well, they think that it's southern Arabia, Ethiopia, because of the Queen of Sheba and the fact that southern Arabia was called Saba. So they assume that the Sabans are the religion of southern Arabia. But the religion of southern Arabia is nothing to do with a book or monotheism or anything else. 
and what it probably really has to do with, and I'm convinced it does, are this intermediate group between Jews and Christians in northern Syria. We call them uh, you know, followers of John the Baptist, <coughs> Mosbuteans, Immersers, Davy Bathers, and even in Arabic still, we call them Suba, the, the plural for Sabaean. But these people are followers of John the Baptist to this day. They exist. They have priests who dress in white called Nazarene, after our word Nazarene. They do ritual immersion, they do laying on of hands, they do all this sort of thing. Uh, they are total Judeo-Christians to this day. They have a lot of Gnostic ideology too mixed in. But they are a remnant, like a sort of a fossil uh, a remnant of a bygone era. But there are stories that they came from northern Iraq, northern Syria. Uh, uh, originally, that the uh, uh, um, that the uh, uh, followers of John the Baptist fled to northern Syria, and always goes to northern Syria, and then come down to southern Iraq. So that's um, uh, that's what I think is involved in calling the Ethiopian queen, and again the same mistake as in Islam, that Saban is considered to be Sheba Ethiopia southern Arabia, when in fact. She's a Judeo-Christian immersing queen. Because I think what you're really saying is she's a Sabaean queen. And to my mind, that's what's all being covered over. Sheba and Saba. Saba meaning bathers. Ritual bathers. Uh, and, and that's the third protected group in Islam. And I think Muhammad traveled to northern Syria. I think he knew the traditions of northern Syria. He got up there in the caravan trade. Uh, Muslim sources said he was in the caravan trade. We know he got to Iraq. The question is how far up in Iraq did he go? He came in touch with, certainly, Manichaeans, which was the next tradition on from some of these other groups, following Mani, who came from a daily bathing. Mani, the founder of Manichaeism, was one of these people from a family in 200 some odd AD from southern Iraq. And then he started a new version of that called what we now call Manichaeism, which became very widespread. And Islam then follows upon Manichaeism. Uh, Mani saw himself as the last of the prophets and so on. But this is where uh, Muhammad plugged in and got the material we now find in the Quran. It's very complicated. No one will ever believe it. I guess we're supposed to recall that Peter was messing around here in Samaria with Simon Magus. Lydda is here, but the city next to it, the old city that's in the New Testament, and it was Jaffa or Jaffa or Jaffa or whatever they call it. And see, they are next to each other. See? Right? But I would parallel this in my work in the Josephus that around this time, Disputes were breaking out. The Roman governors, including Felix, who's going to appear here, he crucified a lot of people at Lydda. Uh, revolutionaries, troublemakers, uh, probably messianic individuals, maybe even a Samaritan messiah. There was called the Tahe. Um, I forget what it means. We get the Roman governors, Pilate. One thing they know about Pilate in the received Josephus. They don't know him, about him killing anyone called Jesus as such. But they do have him <coughs> butchering a person who looks very much like the Tah and mm -hmm. crucifying people in Samaria mercilessly. Now, that's what caught me up here. So Peter is, oh, he comes to a certain disciple at Jaffa <coughs> called Tabitha, which means Dorcas. Some materials have Doetus instead of Dorcas, or some materials have Docetheus, who's one of the people crucified, probably, in these unrest between Samaritans and Jews and Josephus at this point. That's why they have that. But I think, in fact, that's just the surface here. Beneath it is this crucifixion of Doetus at Lydd. Well, whatever it is, notice she's bathed. There's some bathing here going on. 
may or may not be important. So, since Lydda was near Jaffa, where Peter was, two men were sent, and Peter rose up. They go into an upper room. Sounds familiar, going into upper rooms. And there was Dorcas lying down. So Peter does a resurrection. That, that's action. That's the Gospels Acts. Usually have some miraculous thing covering up some other thing that's going on here. The Talmud says that there were two messiahs, and the Talmud says the Messiah son of Joseph was crucified at Lydda. Now Joseph is also a name for the north. That is Samaria, because Joseph's portion was the northern tribes. And so if the Talmud says there are two messiahs, one a messiah ben Ju Judah and the other a messiah ben Joseph, well there we get the connection with the Christian messiah. Jesus is a messiah ben Joseph. Now that may have something to do with the whole story of the crucifixion of Jesus in Jerusalem, I don't know. And it became known throughout all of Jaffa, and many believe that's the glue then. Line 42, we're back to moving the story along. Okay, but chapter 10 is going to be the colonization of Peter. Again, how do we know? Because in Galatians, Paul himself says that before the representatives of James came down, Peter was in the habit of eating with non-Jews, keeping table fellowships. But when the representative of James came down, he stopped doing table fellowship because of the purity regulations. And then he calls those people of the circumcision. And since that's true, Paul spends the rest of Galatians from chapter 2 to 6 going absolutely insane over circumcision. And he's very good at argument and polemics, and he's extremely good at uh, rhetoric. And, and a, a Herodian aristocrat would have been. A Herodian aristocrat would have been well educated in those areas. Uh, a Palestinian peasant wouldn't have been. So, and uh, certainly Paul was no mere tent maker, as some like to portray him as. He was highly schooled in Greek rhetoric. Okay, so in any case, um, we get a presentation where Peter is now told that he shouldn't make problems over these issues. But you see, the Peter in Galatians is not, un is not clear about this. When the chips are down, he goes to the James side, so he's under James's control. Paul, at one point then, he calls them hypocrites. So we know from that that the issue is not resolved in Jesus' lifetime. This is the background. So he is in Jaffa at the, ha at the house of someone called Simon, a, a tanner, by the way, named Simon. Now there was a certain man in Caesarea named Cornelius. Here's our Cornelius, to my mind, of the Lex Cornelia. A centurion, and this is where the Greek comes in handy, of the Italicas. Regiment. Now, this may or may not be important. I think it is. Italica turns out to be a town in southern Spain near present day Seville. It was the Roman settlement, the military settlement in southern Spain, where all the later Roman uh, emperors came from. Nerva, Trajan, and Hadrian all came from Italica. Now, look how he's described a pious one, a God fearer, that's a very important concept in the Dead Sea Scrolls, Damascus document, too. And he had done, uh, he was doing charity uh, to the people, praying to God all the time. Here's a Roman centurion of the most violent band in, uh, in Palestine. He's praying to God all the time and giving charity to the people. This sounds like a picture of James. It's James who we hear is, is, is in fact praying to God all the time in the temple. And about the ninth hour of the day, again we're, we have the person with the stopwatch, he saw a vision plainly, an angel of God coming down. Here's another one, heavenly vision. Now he's having the vision. James has the vision in the death scene, as you recall. Cornelius, or Pete, or, or, or Paul earlier. And he looked up. What is it, sir? Your prayers and your charities have become a memorial for God. And at the end of the Damascus document, uh, that they said that a book of remembrance would be written out for God fears. It was one of the things said in the Dead Sea Scrolls in this very key document. All these references to memorial, to my mind, hark back to that. He said, send the people to see Simon. That's <clears throat> house. Because there's a Peter there, but there's also Simon a Tanner there. It's getting a bit confusing. Any case, he called two of the servants of the pious soldier, and they went to this place, Jaffa, from Caesarea. 
And at the moment, Peter was on the uh, rooftop there, and uh, then suddenly, before anyone comes, it's just, he, he's there on the sixth hour now, and um, he was hungry and making ready, and suddenly he fell into a swoon, and the heavens opened, and, a, and a, uh, uh, something came down, a giant sheet tied at its four corners was being let down from heaven. A tablecloth was being let down from heaven. Now, this is where I, as a historian, part company with the literary people. Uh, and there were all kinds of it were four-footed animals, wild beasts, creeping things, birds. In the Pseudo Clementines, Peter, like James, is a vegetarian. But uh, here it's just to attack dietary regulations. Basically, all the Jewish forbidden foods were on this thing. And uh, a voice cries out from heaven, Get up, Peter! Kill and eat! But the interesting thing is the portrait of Peter. And Peter said, No, Lord, no. I have never eaten anything profane or any unclean thing. There we go. That is the historical Peter. Shines through here. And I've told you before that, to my mind, the writers know that that's the historical Peter. But he has not got Paulinized yet, and Jesus did not regulate these matters. You see, if Jesus had dealt with these issues, then Peter, historically, would not have an issue with these problems and would understand how to behave. But even the writers of Acts, though they want to change Peter at this point, they know very well that normally the Essenes and people like Peter and these other James types didn't eat these things. All this is very important. We'll come back to this next time. Sorry for taking too much of your time. See you next time. You just give me the single one. Okay. That's one of my former students who I mentioned uh, of uh, one of the archaeological expeditions we took out to the Dead Sea Cliffs. And uh, so we got his picture in Time magazine. Um, Peter's tablecloth vision, right? So um, the voice cries out to Peter. Chapter 10, 14. Peter says, I have never eaten any unclean or profane thing. So now, according to this, Peter is keeping what we have to refer to as Jewish dietary laws. Is that fair enough? Anyone disagree with that? So, if Peter is keeping Jewish dietary laws at this point, either he misunderstood uh, Jesus' message, or Jesus didn't regulate that issue in his lifetime. But the Gospels don't agree with that. The Gospels claim the issue was regulated. And up to this point, even Acts author admits Peter is doing this. And never has not done it, according to this. Right? So from that point, then you have to say, why was he doing this if Jesus wasn't? Uh, well, you see, that's the big question. In any case, here's the historical Peter. So even according to Acts, Peter never ate any unclean thing before this vision. But that, does that agree with Galatians? Paul presents Peter as a swing figure. Now, do we have the same person? Is Cephas the same as Peter? Now, we all know what the Cephas problem is, right? And we've already discussed that sufficiently, that sometimes Peter's called Cephas, which is the Aramaic word for rock. Sometimes he's called uh, 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 Peter, which is the Greek word for rock. And uh, other times he's called Simon. In any case, this Peter here is not the Peter in Galatians, in the sense that the Peter in Galatians, Paul calls what? A hypocrite. He says, I know you used to eat with Gentiles, but now when the representative of James came down, you stopped doing this. Which also meant that James was the head honcho. That again, that flies against all doctrine, doesn't it? But it's in the book. It's in the literature. That's the weird thing. It's right in the book, and yet no one can acknowledge it. What stops people from acknowledging it? Uh, because doctrine, doctrine stops it. They're held back by a doctrinaire position. If they step beyond that doctrine, they feel they're in some sort of um, heretical, ideological trouble. But if you're a free person, and at a university we're supposed to, that's what we're supposed to be free. Uh, if we didn't have free inquiry at a university, we'd be, be back with putting Galileo in prison, you know, <laughs> for saying that what we all now accept is obvious. 
that the sun didn't move around the earth, you know. And yet he was silenced for 10 years of his life and put under house arrest for having uh, adopted that position of the previous person who said Copernicus. We have to be able to think freely. So maybe a time is coming when we'll get out from under some of this doctrine too. A fair picture, which I think is in the text. You say, what is it in the text? It's in the early church fathers. Even someone as rabid as Eusebius cannot fail to record it. We even have um, a letter of Peter, uh, Clement in homilies, our Lord and prophet who has sent us, declared us that the evil one that disputed with him forty days, but failed to prevail against him, promised he would send apostles from among his subjects to deceive them, deceiving apostles. Therefore, above all, remember, remember to shun any apostle teacher, this is Peter speaking, or prophet, who does not accurately compare his teaching with that of James, the brother of my Lord, and this even if he comes to you with recommendations. And so the pseudo Clementines say that you're not even allowed to teach if you can't compare your, 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 your doctrines with James. And then we get this a vision here that is really what I would consider to be the polonization of Peter. Because what Peter basically learns is that not to make distinctions between pure and impure. But he doesn't learn it from Jesus. Now, Acts agrees with that. In my view, the authors are setting it up because this is not a historical episode. We all agree that Tablecloths from Heaven is a literary episode. Uh, so that Peter gets a position like Paul to do the Gentile mission, even to Roman centurions. Peter says in 35, so in every nation, he who fears God, there's the god fear language, uh, and works righteousness is acceptable to him. So we have the new position of the early church now. It's not come into the covenant first and then you can have these promises, but anyone who is a God-fearer, so this is directed at God-fearers, and you have to know that god fear is the going parlance for people associated with the synagogues around the Mediterranean who have come into the um, so-called Jewish orbit but are at kind of an associated status still. And uh, that's what I think we're getting here. And that's what we have in the Damascus document. Now the name, uh, finally, of Cornelius, I told you, the importance of the Lex Cornelia de Sicarios e Beneficis. It's the Roman tradition of law. It's a whole body of legislation having to do with bodily mutilations like circumcision. And that then would relate it to the previous material about the Ethiopian queen's eunuch. The author of Acts is a very subtle person, or persons, and he knows very well the arguments of the time. He knows what's going on. He knows that circumcision, as we know from Galatians, is the big issue even in the Christian community. So Paul has to deal with that. And he does. In Galatians, head on. He says, no, absolutely not. Don't do it. But the James party are insisting on it. How do we know it? Because Paul tells me the party of the circumcision, the sum from James, came down. So we know that they were insisting on these things. And he then spends the rest of Galatians and a huge emotional outpouring against circumcision. And the other important thing is the Lex Cornelius, the Sicarius, mentions the word Sicarius, which we now begin to realize is a more and more important thing. At one point in Acts 21, Paul is going to be asked by a Roman centurion, are you a Sicarii? Are you one of those Sicarii that went into the wilderness? And Acts is actually going to use the word Sicarii to refer to Paul, and Paul says, oh, no, no, not me. Um, these people, Paul also calls the party of the circumcision, or those of the circumcision. And, it's not, and, and it also at one point says, we agreed in Jerusalem that they would go to the circumcision and I would go to the uncircumcision. But the Roman word for circumcision is sicarius in some way. Uh, I never realized this until Oregon, who was an early church father, and I didn't realize that these things were uh, so uh, big in the uh, early years of the church. Called him a Sicarius because he had castrated himself. And uh, it's again, I think, Jerome who's laughing at him and saying that he, uh, you know, he misunderstood uh, um, the passage in the Gospel of John or other Gospels saying, make yourself eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven. He took that literally. Hippolytus says there are four groups of Essenes, two of them are called Sicarii Essenes and Celad Essenes.
And that, to me, and the, 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 and, and, and the main characteristic of the Sakari Essenes was, if they came upon someone discussing the law who was not circumcised, basically they did like Muslims do. They offered them circumcision or death, the way Islam offers them Islam or death. In other words, they felt like an extreme Muslim today. He sees a Westerner talking about a Sharia law, he wants to cut their throat. Uh, these groups, I'm not again, these groups, according to Hippolytus, if they found someone um, uh, talking about the law who was not circumcised, they would threaten him with death or circumcision. So they forcibly circumcised people. Such groups would be called Sikari. And Hippolytus calls them that, but he says they're also Essenes. And he also says these Sikari Essenes took part in the war against Rome, this war against Rome from 66 to 70 AD. And the main thing that they were prepared to die for, have martyrdom for, is they would not, you could torture them, kill them, rack them, do anything to them, but they would not blaspheme the lawgiver, Moses, they would not say a bad thing about Moses, and they would, no, they refused to eat things sacrificed to idols. And they refuse to eat things sacrificed to idols. Now, in the received Josephus, he has that. He doesn't call them Sakari Essenes. But he said that they would not blaspheme the lawgiver, and they refuse to eat forbidden things. Now, in that sense, Hippolytus, you see, the little bit different. Hippolytus is a little more precise than our received Josephus. And I think Hippolytus is actually based on an earlier version of Josephus that did not circulate in the West or was a different version. Maybe a more forthcoming version. Because I don't think Hippolytus, or a, 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 um, a, a Roman Christian theologian of the third century, could have had this material and invented it himself. You follow me? It had to come from our source. So look at that. We're going to come upon things sacrificed to idols in a minute. Where are we going to come upon it? In James' instructions to overseas communities. Now he's saying that the Sakari Essenes, they were willing to die for that point. Not to eat things like So I think that's what we're up against here with the party of the circumcision. These are, so I've gone that far. Now, um, Peter um, makes the usual accusation in line 39. We are all witnesses of these things which he, Jesus, did both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. Peter sounds like he doesn't, he's not even a Jew here. We're in the, like the Jews are some foreign people. Again, I think that's the Greek voice writing this in Peter's name. Who the Jews killed by hanging him on a tree. The Jews killed him by crucifying him. But the Jews didn't crucify people. The Jews were forbidden to crucify people. And as Peter was speaking this lecture to, who's he giving this lecture to? The god fears in, 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 in Cornelius' household, right? The Holy Spirit came down on them. So now the Holy Spirit comes down on the god fears. Earlier we had it on the Jerusalem community, right? It was in chapter 1 or 2. Uh, now it's on god fears in uh, Caesarea. And it was poured out on the Gentiles too. So that's it. That's total um, authorization that this is the proper way to go. So this book is... Gentile mission book. It ends then in chapter 10, like the eunuch episode, and I think they are connected in some way, as I've told you, and the circumcision, as you see, is very important. The, so those of the circumcision, you see, they, they, are, they appear here in 45. They don't like what's going on, that the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out on the, uh, Gentiles as well. Chapter 11, Peter then goes up to Jerusalem, and the circumcision guys got up there before. And this is Acts picture. For Acts, does Acts like the circumcision guys? No. Does Paul like them? No. But in Galatians, he's forced to admit that they are the dominant party and they are from James. So I think that we have to understand that this is Acts portrayal of the James party here. So Peter gets up there and explains the whole thing again. I was in the city of Joppa, line five, 
And then in 18, the conclusion is, And hearing these things, they were silent and glorified God, saying, Truly God has given the repentance of life to the Gentiles too. So according to this, we have harmony, everyone accepts Peter's view and so on, but Galatians doesn't present a picture like that. And Galatians is after this. We're about to get into the Pauline missionary activity for the rest of Acts. There's an actual um, logic to all this. After all this, now we're ready for the missions. Because line, it's not the end of the chapter, but 11.18 says God gave the uh, gift of repentance of life to the Gentiles too, so the church is ready to go. So there was a big scattering that took place. Then Stephen, after the death of Stephen, uh, they ran away to Phoenicia, Cyprus, Antioch, and they're preaching the word to no one. Ah, they still admit all, only, they only went to Jews, because of course that's what Galatians said they were supposed to do, only to the Jews. But they just said that Gentiles too. And then certain ones of them were from Cyprus and Cyrene. I don't know what to make of all these things. And there were Hellenists who were preaching the gospel of the Lord Jesus. None of this makes any sense to me. And many turned and were believing, so that's the glue area there. And then Barnabas went to Antioch. And this is the beginning of activities in Antioch, Edessa. And a uh, whole year they gathered together the church and taught. And then prophets came down from Jerusalem, line 27. Uh, and they want to send relief to the brothers in Judea. So we're in a famine relief situation. But Queen Helen and Agrippus and their sons are not being mentioned. And they send to the elders Barnabas and Saul. Because they're in the community in Antioch. So the community in Antioch is a Pauline community according to this book here. And Ananias is of course very important. Well... Chapter 12, we're going to go to Paul's Famine Relief Mission to Jerusalem, right? Wrong. We're not. We should, but we're not. We're sending them up to Jerusalem, <laughs> but it doesn't tell us about the mission. Oh, I don't want to get my usual you know, cynical self, but Acts doesn't know what happened in the mission because it, it doesn't describe the mission. I do think that Barnabas and Paul probably are part of Queen Helen or King Agabus' entourage and Ananias too in northern Syria and they are involved in this famine relief activity but don't forget in Galatians Paul said he left Jerusalem and not, did not return for how many years what if, I don't know what date you give the Galatians uh, or Paul's conversion but um, let's say he converted at the earliest in 36, 37 if you want so he didn't return until 5051, according to him. You'd have to, if you want to credit the 14 years, you'd have to have Paul converting in 31 AD. You know, and that's when Jesus was supposed to have been crucified. Uh, so, you know, you got some date problems here. He said, he, and, he, and he doesn't say he comes back to give famine relief in Galatians. So I left, I was unknown by sight, all they knew that he had formerly persecuted the church, you know, and so on, but the churches in Judea didn't know who I was. And only Peter and the Bertrand's brother in the Lord, I only saw them among the apostles in Jerusalem. And I didn't come back for another 14 years. And I came back, not because I was called back, but because for fear that the course I was running or had adopted would not be allowed. And I came to put the course that I had adopted before these pillars. Not that they're important for anything to me. I don't consider them important. Uh, um, James Kephas and John, the central triumvirate, the leaders of the early church. Later he speaks about Peter, but at that point he speaks about Kephas. So I don't know if it's Kephas and Peter. They're the central three. And then we realize that this is James, the brother of, of um, Jesus. But Acts 12 begins with James, the brother of John. At that time, Herod the king, whoever he is, he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword, i.e. he beheaded him. And all the Jews liked that, line 3, according to Acts, of course. And he was going to seize Peter, too. And it was the time of the unleavened bread, and they put Peter in prison, and then uh, Peter, an angel, helped Peter escape from prison. I'm hurrying here because my time is running short, line 7. And then uh, Peter gets out of prison and uh, the guards are 
ultimately executed for having let him go. But in any case, he hurries, and he goes to the house of a new character, Line 12, Mary, the mother of John Locke. We've never heard of either of those two people before. A new character has suddenly intruded into the narrative. Now, you either accept that or you feel there's a problem. My only reason I think it's a problem is because he goes to this person Mary's house to do what? He's knocking on the door and the message, go tell these things to James and the brothers. What? James and the brothers? But, 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 what James? We haven't met any other James yet. Well, I've introduced you to James. But you don't know any other James, theoretically. You follow me? Right? Why? Well, but the other James has disappeared. We got rid of him right at the beginning of the chapter. By the way, we're on the famine relief mission here, supposedly. So, go tell these things to James. It looks like James has already been introduced to us, right? That's what Acts looks like. Anyone disagree with that? Because Acts should have said, well, uh, this James was the leader of the church. Uh, he was uh, sub at least succeeded Peter. He was the brother of uh, Jesus. Uh, you know, he took care of things while Peter had to leave because Peter had escaped from prison under a death sentence. We would have expected some narrative material like that, wouldn't we? A normal narrative? No, we don't have a normal narrative. Because Acts doesn't want to tell us all those things. Or, and I think this is more the case, it already did tell us all these things, but someone erased it. And I told you when I thought James was introduced. At the time of the election to succeed Judas the Sicarii and then hang everything on poor Sicarius. They're the, they're the guilty ones anyway. They're the most hard people because they're the revolutionaries who cut people's throats. That, that's Judas Iscariot. So in any case, whatever it is, the death and uh, succession to Judas Iscariot is, as I told you, takes the place of the introduction to James in the, uh, whatever the initial material was. Okay, I gotta hurry up. He leaves the message. Uh, 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 James is finally introduced. The next thing we hear, line 25, the word, uh, after Herod is eaten up by worms, the word of God grew and multiplied. That's the glue, the narrative continues, right? That's how we get onto the next episode. And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem, having completed their famine relief mission, bringing with them John Mark. That's why John Mark was introduced. But what? What happened in the famine relief mission? You got me? So all this was supposed to be about the famine relief mission. So something else has been put in the middle of all this about the famine relief mission, and the famine relief mission has gone. In any case, there's a problem with the narrative. A final point, chapter 13, by the way, is now going to go on to the church in Antioch. There are certain prophets and teachers in Antioch, Barnabas, Simeon, called Niger, Lucius, probably Luke, Menaean, probably Ananias, Herod, the Tetrarch's foster brother, we're going to talk about that next time, we already have to some extent, and so on, the church in Antioch. But before that, one last point. Who was beheaded in Josephus at this time? At the time of the famine. All connected to the famine, and uh, Queen Helen's uh, uh, famine relief. Theudas. Thudas, Thaddeus, Judas, the brother of James. Why do I say Thaddeus, surname Lebaeus? Why do I say Thaddeus, surname Lebaeus, is Judas, the brother of James? Because in Matthew and Mark, he's Thaddeus, but in Luke's apostle list, he's Judas, the brother of James. And I say to you, Thaddeus is the same name as Thaddeus. And I say that who's really been beheaded it is a brother, but it's another one of the brothers. It's Judas, the brother of James, who's beheaded here. So, we were talking about the famine relief mission that started in chapter 11 with the prophet, whoever he is, called Agabus. And I'm sure it wasn't a name in either Greek, Aramaic, Syriac, or Hebrew, or Latin but I think it is a garbling of something. You see, that's the weird thing, you know. Sometimes these things actually give you an indication. And so we go to Josephus and we find that uh, 
Josephus is talking at this time about the, the famine relief mission of Helen of Adiabene, Queen Helen. And also we heard from the Eusebius about her husband, or potential husband, as we saw Agaburus or Abgurus, and there's the A, B, G, the, you know, configuration of letters. Uh, they come down. Uh, what's the coming down to Antioch here theme? We're going to have it about three or four different times. I think you could just compress all the coming down to Antioch things into more or less one coming down to Antioch. I think you'll find that the one real coming down to Antioch will be after the Jerusalem conference in chapter 15. Some Two messengers from, well let's just take a look at it, James, which links up then with Galatians, some from James, right? And they are line 32, Judas and Silas being prophets themselves. So here we have the theme of prophets coming down to Antioch. There was a person called Jesus ben Ananias, and he really was a prophet in Josephus, I think. I mean, a prophet, of, if there ever was one at that time, he was one. And what happened to him? As you remember, was after Tabernacles, 62 AD, the year of James' death by stoning, according to Josephus, He's crying, Jerusalem has fallen, Jerusalem has fallen for seven and a half years without cease until what happens to him? He's hit on the head with a missile from a Roman siege engine and he says, and now I'm killed too. And Josephus makes a little joke saying that he was never wrong in any of his prophecies. You know, when Jesus in Scripture goes up to the temple, he predicts its fall. So we have a kind of similarity of uh, themes there of Jesus. But, you know, Jesus is going up to the temple like 40 years before. And I'm not totally convinced that we don't have a retrospective reading back into another person's activities. You know, when we said J Jerusalem fell because of the death of, of uh, James, yeah, I think that's what the believers thought. But did the really believers in 70 AD think that Jerusalem fell because of the death of Jesus 40 years before? You see, it, 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 history doesn't work that way. I think you'll find that this Agabus is a convergence of themes. That this Ananias character, who is Paul's companion, remember, in Damascus, also the intermediary in the Agabus correspondence, also the person involved in the first conversion of Queen Helen, whose conversion is overwritten by a Galilean teacher called Eliezer in Josephus, who wants circumcision. And of course then there's whole in Galatians Paul attack on those who are forcing circumcision on you. And then we get the theme of James being of the circumcision. So we have all these themes converging. So we get these people, they come down and they're prophets, two of them anyway, Silas and Judas come down to Antioch, and who, what are they coming down with at that point in Acts? James' instructions to overseas communities. I think that's basically what the episode is that keeps being repeated. So we're talking about a very curious being, Agabus. And we have Ananias as a prophet, and later on Agabus is going to appear a second time. Acts 21. Agabus appears and he's now, you will remember, he grabs Paul's girdle and ties it in a knot. And he says, this is what the Jews, it's always pretty anti-Semitic stuff. This is what the Jews are going to do to you in Jerusalem if you go up. And Paul rejects him and says, no, no, I'm going to go up. So his, his advice in Acts 21, and again, he doesn't come down to Antioch. What does he do? He comes down to Caesarea. So it's just it's another coming down to. Why do people in this period always say coming down to? Because Jerusalem's on a high plateau. And so it dominates, it's a, it's a strategic location because it has water there. That, that's what makes it, that's the reason for Jerusalem. It's a defensible position, it's strategic, there's water, and it's high, and it's difficult, it's easily defensible and very difficult to assault. It's a fortified high point along a ridge with water. And that's all you need for a good fortress. 
Anyway, okay. So Agabus, um, he produces the the he, the prophecy of the spirit uh, of the famine, and then we get all the material in chapter twelve, where Mary, the mother of John, Mark is introduced. Peter flees. James and the brothers are introduced. No telling who they are. And would you all agree with this? Acts, acts as if we already know who he is. Because when he said, and Peter went to Mary, the mother of John Mark's house, to leave a message for James and the brothers, doesn't that really assume that you're supposed to know who James is, that he should have been introduced? So we talk about sources here in, in, in uh, uh, college courses. What's the source of a given document? Is it built on sources? The two-source hypothesis, the three-source hypothesis, you know, the Q-source, and the Gospels, and so on. What's the source of Acts? What are the documents that went into the writer's final version of these things? Uh, so, you know, I would think in the original source there was an introduction of James. Because this looks like we should know who he is. And does this ever tell us who James is? Never. You know, how do we know who James is? How do we have to find out? Forget the early church fathers. If we, if, if, if we didn't have Paul in, in uh, Galatians, we wouldn't have a clue. Well, you can maybe in the gospel see uh, his mother and his brothers came to him and list the brothers okay, but this doesn't make it clear that this is one of the brothers of Jesus here, does it? You don't see that anywhere mentioned, do you? There's not one word about that. I think that says something. It says the writers were not happy about that, and for the various reasons, either uh, kept it back, discarded it, deleted it, and therefore you have to have an ideological reason for that, don't you? But now all of you will admit that not to tell us who the leader is who seems to have been over Peter, what narrative wouldn't tell us that Bobby Kennedy was Jeff Kennedy's brother? I mean, that, that, that's something uh, that really, um, then you have to think that people have an ideological reason for it. And I think that we see that. Okay, so we have another odd situation where Mary, the mother of, we assume it's the God, or at least of James, Simon, Jude, and Josie's, if it's not of God, is another odd transformation occurs and we get a third Mary or a fourth Mary by a fifth Mary. We've got Mary Magdalene, we've got Mary the mother of James and John in the Gospels, we've got Mary the mother of Hosea, Josie's, and oh we've got, so you start looking at the number of Marys in the Gospels. And now we've got another one we never heard of, Mary the mother of John Mark. I compress all these Marys, except for Mary Magdalene. I compress all these Marys into one Mary. Mary the mother of God. Mary the mother of Jesus. And what I say is going on here is the editors later are having problems with the doctrines relating to her status. And it's not surprising, therefore, that someone would go to her house to leave a message for James, isn't it? Just that the writer doesn't want to go further than that. The writer doesn't want to tell us these family relations because the writer is a Paulinist and is not happy with the family leadership of the early church. 13. Certain prophets and teachers back to this theme in Antioch. Remember we're worried about which Antioch this is. But here they are. Barnabas, Simeon, called Niger, whoever that was. Niger means shoemaker, but something else. It also There was a Niger in Josephus who is one of the revolutionary leaders, who has a death in Josephus in the time of the war against Rome, very much like Jesus. He carries his own cross out of a city and stuff. It's a very interesting uh, parallel. I've always been curious about the Niger. It can also be black in Greek, too. Lucius the Cyrenian, who I think is Luke, to whom we attribute this. Cyrene is where? North Africa, next to Egypt, present-day Libya. These, now, these are the prophets and teachers who whatever we want to make up. Now, a really weird name. Manan. Manan. There may have been such a person. It's a possible Greek. I don't think it's, uh, you'll find any other name, person never named that in any Greek literature. 
I think it's another one of these garbles. I'll tell you who I think it is. I'll bet you already know who I think it is. Anyway, the interesting aside is he was a close relative and brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, who's a nasty piece of work, as we know, who we know was responsible for the death of John the Baptist. A foster brother of his is among the founding members of the church in so-called Antioch, wherever that is. Okay, I think that's a tremendously important notice. I think about the only human being in the history of the church that is who ever even paid any attention to it. Barnabas, we know, it's all. I think a little bit of a shell game is going on here again. Because of the theory I've already enunciated to you, right or wrong, that Paul was an Herodian. That it's actually Paul who's the foster brother of Herod the Tetrarch. And all they've done in the same way that they've done with the, uh, Peter, John, and James, his brother, they've made the brother look like the brother of John and not the brother of Jesus. In this case, the foster brother just moved over to here. But, I mean, there is some basis for thinking it if Saul is a Herodian. And in the genealogies, we do pinpoint a character that could be Paul. There is a Saulus in the genealogies, and he is related to these other Herodians. And he does play a part in Josephus. And he does appeal to Rome, and he does go to Rome to report to the emperor. And he's a quite an important person. He's the intermediary between the Roman forces besieging the city and the peace party inside the city. And then he goes to Nero and reports on the situation in, in uh, Palestine and he's never heard from again. So the last we hear of him in uh, Josephus is approximately 66 AD. The same as in Acts. The last we hear of Paul is around that time, but Paul, uh, Acts doesn't tell us what happened to Paul. Neither did just, uh, does Josephus tell us what happens to Saul, the Herodian prince. Then who is Menae? Oh, I think it's just Paul's old friend Ananias, Garbo. This is what happens, like Agbarus, Abgarus, the letters get moved around in, in transcription and from one language to another. Yeah, I think, yeah, Mene, well, who are we missing here? Ananias. That's the person who converted Paul. That's the person who's in Antioch. We, we know he's in Antioch all the time. Why is he among these people? Yeah, he is. He's Menaean. Oh, well, so he's the foster brother of Herod the Tetrarch. No, I don't think so. I think Saulus is the fourth foster brother of Herod the Tetrarch. Chapter 13. So now the Holy Spirit said, Separate Barnabas and Saul to me. So they come. The other, Barnabas wasn't even an original apostle either, was he? Uh, the other apostles are really gone out of this narrative, except for the Jerusalem conference that's going to come, but we're not going to hear about them at all anymore. From now on, Chapter, from chapter 8 or 9, it's been Paul, but really 13 on, it's Paul. And the problem, too, we never hear what happens to the other ones. We don't get Peter's death. We don't get James's death. You'd think we would like to know something about that. But we've covered that enough. So off to Sy Cyprus they go. Cyprus is a weird name, as in the original language is uh, sometimes called Kit. The Kittim in the Dead Sea Scrolls, or the, the enemies from overseas are called the Kittim, probably originally Crete, back in the days of the Cretan Empire. And then the Sumerians, for some reason, are called Kutans in the Hebrew literature. And I, sometimes Cyprus can mean Samaria. So there's a lot of slipping in the names. Salamis is, is a town in the real Cyprus, and where's the first place they go? to the synagogues. Why do they go to the synagogues? Oh, because there's fertile territory for them to, uh, to operate with it. But in Galatians, we heard they weren't going to go to the synagogues. Uh, so right away, everything Paul does is against the agreement that he pictures himself as having made here. And when they saw 2.9, the grace which was given to me, James, Cephas, not Peter, and John, gave these esteemed pillars earlier we said not that their importance means anything to him 
gave the right hand of fellowship to Barnabas and me that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcision. That was the only caveat that, that they should stay away from the uh, Jews. Anyway, he meets a magician here on, 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 on Cyprus, Paphos, called Bar Jesus, a Jew. <coughs> And he also meets a proconsul with the strange name of Sergius Pallas. Maybe that's how he took his name from this being adopted by this proconsul. We don't know. It's all very curious here. And hearing the word of God, he talked to this uh, magician, Alemus, uh, opposed to them. And so they all have, a, they have an argument. And Paul stares him down and fixes his eyes on him. And he says, you son of the devil full of tricks and cunning, you enemy, he uses the enemy terminology there. Now we know how some groups were using the enemy terminology against Paul. Paul uses it against this magician or whoever he is. Perverting the right ways of the Lord, and anyway, he was immediately struck, dark, dumb, darkness fell on him, and everyone was amazed until Paul wins that one with the magician. I think this is supposed to be Simon Magus here. I, and that's why Cyprus, I think, is Samaria, really. This is a representative. There are not all these magicians running around here. This is a Simon Bagus figure. The Elimus probably put... And, and this, again, hooks up with the Pseudo-Clementines. And the enemy terminology, Simon Bagus appears in there. I can't go any further than that, but that's what happens on Cyprus, plus meeting Paulus. Off we go, line 13, to the next place. He leaves Cyprus. And he goes to Asia Minor, Pamphylia. And then an interesting thing occurs. Line 13, John left them and returned to Jerusalem. It doesn't say positive, negative. It doesn't say the reason why. It's just what we would call in English laconic, right? John left them and returned to Jerusalem. Is there any problem here? Doesn't look like it. He just left and returned to Jerusalem, right? Wrong. We're going to hear in chapter 16 or 15 at the end of the Jerusalem conference when they're starting out on another trip line 36 after they come down with the James's letters but after some days Paul said to Barnabas now let us return and look after our brothers this is after the Jerusalem conference and they come down to Antioch and every city which we preach another missionary journey the third or the second I don't, I don't think these are all separate but anyway. and Barnabas wanted to take John Mark with them Mark is, John Mark is probably Mark, the author of the gospel that we call Mark. But Paul did not agree. It was good to take the one who had deserted their work in Pamphylia. So for Paul, he was deserted then. And there came a, a sharp fit of argument, anger between them. So they separated from each other. And Barnabas took Mark and sailed away to Cyprus. And it's at this point that Paul chooses new traveling companions, Silas and some others. And we never hear of Barnabas again either in the narrative. Now, we already know in Galatians, Barnabas broke from Paul when it was over the, the, the some from James, remember? And uh, Barnabas and Peter both stopped uh, keeping company with Paul, and Paul attacks them as hypocrites. I think this is Acts' version of the same thing. Acts knows that Barnabas and Paul have fallen out. But Acts adds this other character, John Mark, and now we know that John Mark has done something. And I, what does John Mark do, do? I think if this is reliable, I don't know if it is. He's gone back to Jerusalem and reported on his activities and how he's conducting himself overseas. That's why Paul is so and that's why the Jerusalem community seems to know what Paul's been doing and why they call him to account in the matter of the Jerusalem conference or in uh, when he supposedly goes up to Jerusalem in Galatians. John Mark is, if you like, the spy or whatever. Anyway, Paul, there's another Antioch, this time at Pisidian. So there's at least two Antiochs in Acts. This one, by the way, is further north in Asia Minor. Then again, Paul gets up. He makes a speech. But notice his speech is addressed to Israelites and God-fearers. The associated Gentiles at the synagogues. 
you are my son, uh, quotation from the second psalm, today I have begotten you, which is the uh, what's called out at the baptism according to the apocryphal gospels and Hebrews. Um, in the normal gospels it's you are my son, uh, uh, and you I am well pleased, but I think this may be more, uh, more like what was uh, originally considered to be a set, but that would make it some adoptionist uh, type of uh, sonship. Uh, and so, but the Jews, line 50, stirred up the devoted honorable women and chief men and raised a persecution and they expelled them out of the city and they shook the dust off their feet. The next thing they do, chapter 14, and to the next synagogue. Well, if you're having trouble in synagogue after synagogue, why, why would you do this? So you see, there's one way of looking at it, and there's another way. But the main thing is the th the act is repeated over and over and over again. So the missionary journeys are basically the same. Go into a synagogue where the Jews are, upset the Jews, and try to siphon off some of the others who are there, uh, who are interested in Judaism for some reason or other, into this new form that Paul is preaching in his new message. See you next time.